Hi everybody, Joanna here. Today I'm going to be talking about A Song for Our Bone by Guy Gabriel K. I'll be getting a little bit personal in this video as well as a little bit historical. And it is a historical fantasy standalone. Like many Guy Gabriel K standalones, it's fantasy because it's set in a secondary world, but it very much resembles a certain period in history. And in this case, in this book, we are dealing with what very much resembles France in the Middle Ages. And I'll be talking a little bit about troubadours later as they play a big part in this story. It also has magic, but the magic is very minimal. So we're dealing with a character who has psychic abilities. That's pretty much the extent of the magic. Maybe owls could be considered magical to some extent, but for the most part, it's very minimal as far as that's concerned. In this particular story, we're dealing with two contrasting cultures and societies. So down in the south, we have Arbonne, which worships a goddess indicated by the two moons in the sky. There is courtly love. There is music. There, is, there are festivities. There are troubadours. Troubadours are composers and poets, and they write songs, especially songs dedicated to the noble women of the land. And this is a way of not only respecting and admiring the women, but the women are actually lauded. If you are a noble woman, you want a troubadour to write a song about you because that's the way that you could feel you could feel praised and honored. And this is actually good for uh, the noble woman's husband too, because it just does wonders for his reputation as well if his wife is being lauded by song. So this is very much part of the culture, though up north, this is very much contrasted by um, a very severe culture of men, of patriarchy, where they look down on women, they see them as objects, they're abusive towards women, They women are may not speak out of line, they may not speak their minds, there is no music there, and they look down on the Southern culture as being very frivolous. And we learn about these contrasts through a mercenary character from up north named Blaze. Blaze comes to Arbonne, he actually travels to the island, so he's exposed to the religion there, and then he's exposed to all the traditions that are on our bone. And at first you can feel the eye rolling that happens in Blaze's character in his mind. But like most Guy Gabriel K stories, you see how he starts to become affected by it. Now, I don't think I've ever read a book where the use of song was ever so impactful. Now, the songs in this book are not just that of women, not just that of love, but also that of story, that of war, that of honor. And you could see how that affects the characters directly. Now, I don't want to go too much more in depth about the story because I think it's best to go in and not know too much. I will say that the prologue of the story takes place 23 years earlier, and I think it's a good idea to keep in mind the different characters that are introduced in the prologue as they will play a role later on in the story. So I did take some time to write that out. And the book is divided into seasons. So we're starting out with the season of spring, going into midsummer and then autumn and then winter. One of the main themes of this book is no surprise. It has to do with gender and specifically what a healthy society or a healthier society looks like when women are respected. And I would say that in Arbonne, it's not necessarily that it's the healthiest society. There are internal politics there. There, I would say, is a patriarchy in place. There are conversations about how women are restricted by certain protocols to some degree, but it's certainly much healthier than up north where they do not even give women the time of day. They just see women as objects. They abuse women if they speak out of line. So there's a stark contrast there. And it's also interesting the way the north critically looks down upon the men in the south where men do respect women. There's almost this idea that maybe men who do that or who can handle troubadours or who are troubadours, maybe lack valor. And at the same time, it's kind of funny and pokes fun at this idea that these men who are so manly, who are so powerful, get triggered so easily by the lyrics of a song, which is basically what happens in the story without giving away too much. Another huge theme in this story, no surprise, has to do with song. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about troubadours here before going back into other elements of this story. So a little departure here. Now, troubadours were prestigious musicians in the Middle Ages. They were sponsored by courts and castles, and 
This was in contrast to some of the other musicians at the time, which might have been wandering minstrels or juggleurs, which comes from the root word of juggle, people who juggled and played music and tried to get a living that way, um, bards. So there were troubadours in the south of France that came from the Occitan language, and then there were trouvères up north, and that's from the old French language. There were also female troubadours, and I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation of this, but they were called troubarites. I'm going to butcher that. I apologize. But yes, there were female troubadours at that time too, and that's kind of the case in this book. Now, in this book, in A Song for Our Bone, they have not only troubadours who write the songs and write the poetry and sometimes sing, but they also have what are called jogglers. And at first I thought, are they, is that kind of like jugglers? But no, in this case, the jogglers were just people who sang the music. So I don't think there's really a relationship, even though initially I thought there might be. Uh, but the jogglers would sing the songs typically that the troubadours would write. And another true thing about troubadours is that they put a lot of intention into the poetry and into the melodic phrasing. Most of their songs were syllabic, which means one syllable per note, though sometimes they would have melismas just a little bit here and there to showcase a certain word for dramatic effect. And most of their songs were, in fact, love songs, chassons, or canzos, and they did involve romantic longing and desire. And there were also songs called albas, which is a morning song. And sometimes those songs were were narrated by the troubadour to as a sentinel for the two lovers who were waking up in the morning, letting them know that dawn is coming. So there were some beautiful love songs that these troubadours wrote and sang. But additionally, there were also other kinds of songs, including pastoral songs. There's even a famous one on the play of Robin and Marion. We still have a lot of existing songs from this time. And as you can see with the notation at the time, it's not very clear about the rhythm, but there are some scholars who think that the songs were to be sung very freely and unmeasured, whereas other scholars argue otherwise. So it's interesting to speculate about that, but they were important to that time. They were important in courts. So that is very much the case. And in fact, they led very interesting lives. Some of them had their historical biographies written down called Vidas. Apparently, they were quite extravagant tales of their lives. So they were very important at that time. And I thought it was just beautiful the way that they were written into this particular book. Because again, I think that the songs were very impactful, not just about courtly love again, but about other things that are going on in this story that tie together in a beautiful, heartfelt way, very poignant at times. I want to talk about a few other things I noticed that seemed to me like little chaosms, if I can find a way to put it. They were things that I noticed that were in this story that I found had parallels to The Lions of Alrasan. And this is only my second Guy Gabriel K book. So I don't know if he uses these devices more frequently, and I will not spoil anything for either book. But I'm just going to talk about a couple of, of devices I noticed in common between the two books. So the first one has to do with the use of an innocent young character. This usually had to do with the youngest character in the story. So in the lines of Alrasant, there was a young boy named Alvar who followed around our El Cid character, Rodrigo. And in this particular story, we had a young, innocent girl, Liso. And Liso did find herself listening in on conversations where she maybe shouldn't have, very similar to Alvar at the beginning of the story. And she also provided, I think, some lighthearted comic relief at times. And I mean, there were just some similarities there that I just couldn't help but notice. Beautiful character, though. I loved Liso's character. Another thing, which I kind of already mentioned, is that the magic, the minimal magic, has to do with psychic magic. It was very much the same in the lines of Alrasan, where the only magic in that story had to do with a certain character who had psychic abilities. So that was another thing I noticed. And then another one had to do with a certain type of arrow. And I'll say no more than that in case it's a spoiler, but notice that in both stories. Next is that there was a setup to think that one character was in danger when it's a different character in danger. The way he set this up in both books felt very similar where I'm dreading something that's happened to a certain character based on the perspective of one character. And then we switch around and realize, oh no, it's a different character that's in danger. So I noticed that was similar. And then another thing too is kind of going back to uh, 
the young character thing is that there is a young innocent character who becomes infatuated with an older character. Um, that setup is flipped gender wise in this book, but it's there as well as it was in the Lions of Alrasan. So I noticed that there were some similarities. There are probably a couple more I could point to, but I'm trying to be very vague here so I don't spoil anyone for anything. But I did notice that and I still enjoyed the way he did that. I still enjoyed those little devices. But I wonder how often he uses those things in other books since this is only my second K book. And I noticed several things that felt in common to the Lions of Alrasan. Another thing, though, that I think Kay does so well is the way that he writes older female characters. If you're somebody like me and you want to see more older female representation in fantasy, I highly recommend picking up a Kay book because just like the female physician character in the Lions of Alrasan, there are several wonderful female characters in A Song for Our Bone. Definitely characters who are aged up a bit but still beautiful, still graceful. And added to that, I also love the friendship dynamics that form in this story. Now, something I think Kate likes to explore based on the two books I've read so far is how travel and exposure to people who are not like you can change you as a person, how it could shape your worldview or expand your worldview. And also the found family trope. Tropes never feel like tropes in a Kate book for me personally. But I feel like he creates a wonderful sense of found family, both in the lines of Alrasan, but also in this book, where you see characters come together for, for a common cause, and you see the bond between the characters. And it's also special, I think, to see people become friends and bond as adults, because I think in fantasy, we often see those friendships form in the teenage years or when people are coming of age. So it's wonderful and beautiful to see that happen. In older adulthood. I noticed those things in common with the Lions of Valrasan, but they were positives in every way possible for me in A Song for Our Bone. This particular book showcased love and friendship in such a beautiful way, and romantic love too. I think that the romance scenes were beautiful. Kay's prose is stunning. It is beautiful, it is lyrical, it is imaginative, and the songs again. Now I'm going to get a little bit more personal about the song scenes because I said I would at the beginning of the video. So the songs were beautiful and there was a range. Just like I said, in real history, the troubadours didn't just write about one kind of love. There were different types of songs that they wrote. So I appreciated the range of songs that were present in this book and they added so much dramatic effect as I already mentioned. But I particularly loved the way that he would set it up in the festival scenes where there was so much merriment and music and laughter and joy and drink and tradition of coming together for a certain event at a certain time of year. What I loved too was that while there was all this music and hum going on in the air, there were also moments where everything would quiet down around a single performer singing a song. And there were moments when the festivities were occurring when a certain musician character would leave the scene to be alone and sing songs. And to me, that spoke to me personally, both types of situations, because when I was a teenager, you could not shut me up. I sang everywhere I went, but I, I specifically have memories of being at parties. And sometimes I'd be asked to sing at gatherings, either at events with campfires and friends or at parties with people. Um, I would sing a solo for a group of friends. And the next thing I knew, I'd have a huge crowd listening to me and they'd have me sing again and again. And uh, it brought me back to that. It brought me back to that experience and exactly what that felt like. Just the warmth of that atmosphere and the stillness in the air. I just felt that when I was reading the book. And then the second type of experience is that I remember often whenever I'd go to gatherings or parties when I was that age, I would often find myself needing to introvert a little bit here and there. Um, I consider myself kind of an ambivert. I enjoy being with people. It energizes me, but sometimes I do need some solitude. And so sometimes I'd be at these gatherings or parties and I would just kind of wander off to a quiet space by myself and start singing. And usually when I did that, I'd look around me a little while later and find that there were people gathered around me listening, <laughs> that a few friends would follow me. And uh, I have fond memories of that too. But it just really brought me back to that. The power of song and music and gatherings and warmth and friendship, 
I thought that was just so beautifully captured in this story. Um, it was very nostalgic for me for that reason. But yeah, I just wanted to share that because it, it did add a layer of something for me. So that concludes my thoughts for now on A Song for Our Bun. Wonderful exploration of gender and friendship in adulthood. Song, the power of song. Two contrasting cultures and societies. And there are some pretty heavy, dark moments, I should say, in the second half of the book that I didn't even mention. I will be getting into a spoiler-filled discussion here on my channel if you want to hear spoiler-filled thoughts. But this was a beautiful book for me. I thoroughly enjoyed my experience reading it. I hope that some of what I shared here was helpful for you if you're interested in picking this up. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.